Well, we have been in a series that we've titled Rival Gods, and now we have come to the final installment in this series. Our quest has been to understand how the prominent gods of our culture and our age, namely the gods of power, money, and sex, have tried to take up all the attention and emotional space and focus of human lives. We feel the tug and the pull of this trinity of ugliness upon us through our culture all the time. The entire advertising industry, social media, everywhere we go in this world, we are confronted with a barrage of images and messages that are prompting us to want more power, more money, more lust. And we have discovered in the biblical narrative that there is one true God that stands head and shoulders above everything this world has to offer and communicates to us a beauty that tugs upon our hearts in ways that nothing else ever does. Now, in our final time together, I have rather darkly titled the message, The Murder of God. And I want to tell you the true story of a 12-year-old boy the story is told by Frederick Buchner in his book, The Magnificent Defeat. And in this book, he tells the story of this boy who, in a fit of rage, rebelling against his father's authority, the boy found a gun in the house and killed his father. He was apprehended, of course, and placed in a juvenile detention facility. And when the police officers asked the little boy, why did you kill your father? He said, because he was telling me too many things to do. I didn't like his authority. I rejected him and I killed him. Later on that evening, the guards in the facility reported, strangely enough, that the boy could be heard through the night crying and whimpering on his bed, I want my daddy, I want my father, give me my father. Well, the fact is that the fit of rage that had filled this boy's heart gave way to what could only be described as an inconsolable ache. And I want to suggest to you that our world is experiencing an inconsolable ache as we have increasingly pushed God out of our consciousness. We have been on a collision course with nihilism or the idea that nothing means anything except for the present moment and everything that this world has to offer. In fact, we've been on a historical journey and we ourselves, those of us in this room and who live in Western culture right now, we are presently on the tail end of a negating of God from human awareness so that Western civilization, it can be said, has killed God from human awareness and consciousness for all practical purposes. And we're beginning, however, to see that human beings who have negated God are now beginning to cry out for him like a child who has murdered his father. This is a kind of collective phenomenon that's occurring. Individuals are crying out for God, yes, but the world itself is not sustainable without the inconsolable ache that only God can fill being satisfied. Now, in Western civilization, there have been a number of towering thinkers, not least among them, Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist, in quote marks, because nobody could quite nail him down to find out, are you an atheist or not? He was a commentator on the process or the trajectory of the scientific revolution that was overtaking Western culture. And to Nietzsche, 
at one point commented that God is dead. In fact, it's a common bumper sticker that you can see even around Eugene here. That God is dead and God remains dead, the philosopher, the thinker, Nietzsche said, and we have killed him. In other words, God has not faded from human consciousness accidentally. We have deliberately engaged in a process, a trajectory of existence in which God has become more and more dispensable and then unnecessary. At least we imagine so. And so Nietzsche proclaimed, God is dead. We don't need him anymore. And we ourselves, the culture itself, the scientific revolution itself, progress has killed God in human awareness. And yet Nietzsche cannot help but comment that yet his shadow still looms. How shall we comfort ourselves? How shall we comfort ourselves? The murderers of all murderers. We've killed God, Nietzsche says. And of course you can't kill God out of existence, but you certainly can kill God out of all the equations of your life. You can kill God out of the awareness of your need for him. You can gradually work yourself in to a deep, dark hole of unbelief in which you no longer sense a need for God. But it gets really dark inside the human psyche where God is finally and fully pushed out. What we see taking place in our culture, however, is being commented upon by numerous scholars and researchers in a book that I find very fascinating by James Emery White. The title alone is provocative, The Rise of the Nuns, and you have that checkbox there because throughout the United States and Western Europe, increasingly we're able to track how that on different kinds of legal forms, when the question is asked, what is your religious affiliation, increasingly more and more people are simply checking none. I have no religious affiliation. I have no belief system whatsoever. In fact, the Barna Group has reported to us rather recently in 2018 that atheism is perceived to double among Generation Z. And that is to say that teenagers right now are on a deep, deep search for meaning that does not include God oftentimes. There is this growing perception that God is an illusion or a myth and is not needed. But here's what I'm going to suggest to you this morning. No matter how dead you think you've killed God, you still long for him. Because the fact is, human nature is a space that must be filled with something. Human nature is a space. You are not, I am not, a solo project, a solo creature. You and I are by nature, psychologically, emotionally, and even biologically, we are engineered for a kind of deep, fellowship with the God of the universe that somehow we just can't completely shake. So what's happening is that not only is there a space in us, but that space that exists in the human soul, it's a kind of vacuum. I mean, it's like a black hole that's sucking in everything around it, whatever's in our orbit. We're just taking in whatever it is the world has to offer because not only are we by nature a space that must be filled with something, there is a vacuum effect that is occurring. You and I have a kind of gravitational pull going on all the time inside of us. Every waking moment, we are defined by desire, by longing, yearning for something more than anything this world has to offer. And so I'm going to say that the space, which is in fact a void that pulls, that pulls, it's a vacuum. I'm going to suggest that it's an ache. 
that there is a kind of undergirding pain pulsating in the human heart, that we want something that we can't quite put our finger on, and that even when we do our very best rationally, intellectually, cognitively to reject God, we still long for him. And I'm going to suggest to you that the reason we long for him is because he longs for us. That his love itself is a gravitational pull. That God loves us first, and his love, which is primary, is precisely what it is that will not leave us alone. You are possessed, I am possessed, of a nagging suspicion that we were made for a perfect love that finds no satisfying match in this world. So what's going on is that this gravitational pull, this vacuum effect, human beings are a space that has to be filled, so we've tried to fill the void with the tyrannical gods of power, money, and sex, and we just keep coming up empty-handed in this quest. I mean, we live in a time and in a part of the world in the West, we live in a time and a place of abundance. You can literally get anything you want at the touch of a screen. And yet, the offices of psychotherapists and counselors are more full than ever. Because human beings, with everything they could possibly desire at their fingertips, are not satisfied. And in fact, the best this world has to offer can only serve to accentuate the inconsolable ache that pulsates deep inside of us. Not only do we come up empty-handed, we come up over and over again empty-hearted feeling like there's got to be something different, something more, something other. The fall of humanity, what we refer to theologically as, as the fall, with a capital F. In fact, the fall of humanity entailed an upset of human power dynamics. It involved, clearly, in the narrative that we are given in Scripture, sexual exploitation, and greed over material resources. In fact, if you read Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis 1 and 2 is a depiction, a picture of what it looks like for human beings to exist in a beautiful series of relational dynamics with one another as husbands and wives and with the resources of the earth. It's only natural, it is logical to realize that in fact, that in fact, that the gods, the false gods, the idols that are most prominent down through history and in our time now, the, the gods of power, money, and sex are precisely the only gods that could occupy the highest positions of interest short of encounter with the one and only true God. Because you and I, think this through, we were made for healthy power dynamics. We were made for healthy sexual dynamics. We were made for healthy resource or economic dynamics. In fact, with the areas of power, sex, and money, we have before us the three constituents of human life any direction you look on this planet at any given moment. These are the three prominent mediums of interaction that our world is defined by because God made us originally for power, sex, and resources to be the medium through which the quality of our existence is exalted and maintained. But when that which is good becomes absolute, idolatry occurs. When those things that are in themselves 
good take the position of ultimacy. They are expected to provide satisfaction on a level they cannot. And so nihilism sets in, nothingism, a sense of, wow, nothing means anything, so go ahead and do anything. And our culture currently is overrun with a sense that life has no actual ultimate, transcendent, eternal meaning. All you have is 70, 80, 90, 100 years, so get all you can get. Indulge your senses. Take and eat and drink and indulge because that's all you've got. J.R.R. Tolkien, one of the most remarkable thinkers who ever put pen to paper, created a literary device to explain the dark dynamics of idolatry. That literary device in his book series, The Lord of the Rings, was the ring of Sauron, the ring of power. This is the thing. Everybody wants and anybody who gets it doesn't want. The genius of this literary mechanism is that it helps us understand something that a scholar of Tolkien's work, Thomas Shippey, says the ring is a sort of psychic amplifier. Note the language. The ring in the story, in the narrative, operates as a psychic amplifier. That is to say, the ring as a psychic amplifier serves to magnify the unconscious fears and selfishnesses of its owner. Whoever possesses the ring, which is the most desirable thing in the story, finds that the ring itself begins to control them. And now they want to offload it, but the addiction is so strong that they want to, and yet they don't want to offload it onto somebody else. And what happens is the story informs us that anybody who becomes obsessed with the ring enters into bondage to its power and loses their own identity in the process. A kind of monstrification process occurs. Anybody who possesses the ring, gradually everything sensitive and good and kind and beautiful begins to ebb away from their personality and character, and they become the amplification of their worst psychic patterns. Sin... In this, Tolkien has communicated to us through his literary mechanism, sin amplifies our hunger for power, money, and sex. Thomas Keller, Timothy Keller, excuse me, comments on this incredibly ingenious way of communicating the power of idolatry through Tolkien's work, the wearer of the ring becomes increasingly enslaved and addicted to it. The wearer of the ring, please track with this, think this through with me. The wearer of the ring becomes increasingly enslaved and addicted to it, for an idol is something we cannot live without. So, so on that note, I want you to contemplate with me. I want you to ask yourself a very personal and serious and introspective question. What is the thing in your life right now that if it were removed, you would implode and have no desire for ongoing existence? What is the thing in your life that you just can't live without? The thing that if it were removed, you would settle into a sense of nihilistic, wow, nothing matters then without him, without her, without that, without the career, the education, the reputation. Is there anything in your life that holds the position of supremacy? That's the question. Because what I'm suggesting to you is that God alone 
can rightfully occupy the position of supremacy and thereby give meaning and significance to everything and everyone else. Even power, money, and sex are not bad in and of themselves, and even power, money, and sex are not realities that God wants to take from you and me, but rather to put them in their proper place in relation to his love. So Keller goes on to say that idols are spiritual addictions, quote-unquote. You can't see that, but idols are spiritual addictions. Now think that language through for a minute. Spiritual addictions. I asked you a moment ago, what is the thing, if it were removed, would cause you to implode? Well, you know, there are people who are addicted to power. There are people who are addicted to money and things. And there are people who are addicted to sex. But pause to think about this for a moment. There are people, maybe you, maybe me, who are addicted to religion. Toxic forms of religion that negate and hurt and wound people in the process of exalting the religious institution or the religious list or the religious theological point above the well-being of the people around you and me. So Keller goes on and he says, listen, what's happening in the process of idolatry is that a human being is gradually sinking in to the worst of themselves. But then he says something very fascinating. Keller says that an idol cannot simply be removed. Now listen, an idol cannot simply be removed. You can't just remove an addiction. You can't just remove the obsession for power, the obsession for things, the obsession for sex. You can't remove an idol. It has to be replaced. In other words, there has to be a point at which we realize as human beings that we are actually designed as human beings to be filled with a reality that exceeds power, money, and sex. So, Scripture answers the question. And here's the question. Here's the begging, pressing question. If an idol cannot be removed, simply removed, but needs to be replaced, if that's the case, the begging question is replaced, of course, with what? Replaced with what? And Scripture answers the question. The what is a who? There is one true God who alone exists for the purpose of meeting your deepest needs. So Keller communicates to us the idea that idols can't simply be removed. They must be replaced, which begs the question, of course, replaced with what? And what I'd like to share with you in the time that we have together this morning remaining is that there's a sense in which the overarching biblical narrative, listen now, that Scripture really is the story through which this one question is answered. Exactly what are you as a human being and what is it that you are to be filled with and satisfied by? If idolatry is bad, then what is good? Because we're not going to be productive by merely condemning bad things. We need to put something in the place of that which is bad that is so infinitely better that that which is bad is no longer wanted, no longer longed for. And so Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 39 Moses is telling us that we should engage in a deliberate process of doing something. So I'm going to ask you to do it with me now, okay? He says, hey, I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to give you a recommendation, and here's the recommendation. I want you to acknowledge, acknowledge, and take to heart this day that the Lord is God, 
in heaven above and on earth below, and there's no other. Okay, this is, this is the recommendation of Moses. Moses is saying, hey, I've thought this through. In fact, I was raised in Egypt, and there were multiple idols, multiple false gods. I'm very familiar, Moses might tell us, with the religions of the world, and now I've encountered the Lord. By the way, you'll see that the Lord is, is all caps here, small caps, because every time you read in the Old Testament, Lord, it's Yahweh. It's a name. It's the specific God that stands over against in contrast to all the other possible choices for religions and philosophies and gods and, and idols. So, so Moses is coming along, and you have to remember, you have to be aware of his context. There is a historical, a geographic, and a cultural context. And what is that context? It is a context in which there are, it's multiple choice, man. There is Dagon and Molech. There is Ishtar. There is Baal. The list is long of notions or ideas or conceptualizations of God. And Moses is saying, no, 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 it's Yahweh alone. In fact, I'm going to tell you something really interesting, and that is that in the first century after Christ, the Christians were actually accused of being atheists because they had what the Romans considered to be a poverty of God's. Because what Christianity had done was to negate Zeus and Ishtar and every other notion of God and say, no, 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 no. There's just one God. Just one God. His name is Yahweh, and he's God in heaven above, the earth beneath. In other words, he's taking up all the geography in the universe. That's the point that Moses is making. There's not some region over here among the Hittites where there is a legit God. There's not some region over here among the Romans or the Greeks or the Babylonians or the Egyptians where there's some other legitimate God. There is no God but one God, and it's Yahweh. Now, here's what you're going to find fascinating. When Moses communicates that there's one God and only one, the question that we need to ask is, okay, Moses, so there's just one God, his name is Yahweh. How do we know that this one God is worthy of our adoration and our worship and our praise? How do we know that this is the one and only true God? How does, in other words, the one true God distinguish himself from all false gods? Well, he goes on in Deuteronomy itself in chapter 32 to say, okay, I will proclaim the name. The word name here literally refers to or approximates the idea of character, the internal content of thoughts and feelings and, and the behavior patterns. So I'll proclaim to you the name, the character of Yahweh. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. Well, what, Moses, what makes God great? Oh, look at this. This is astounding. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Do you see what Moses just did? He said, listen, listen, I'm proclaiming to you the one true God. There is no other. And what distinguishes this God is not his power, but his character. The God of Scripture, the one and only true God of history, is distinguished by his attributes. Not by his sheer might, the magnitude of his divine muscle to overpower. The God of Scripture is not a God of overpowering. He stands apart from, distinguished from, all other notions of God, all idols, all false gods by his character. And what is the character of this God? Well, throughout the writings of the prophets, including David in the Psalms, the Old Testament paints a picture of God that is just, is just astounding. It's beautiful. It's exquisite. It's attractive. When you encounter the God that is portrayed in Scripture, you are literally blown away because you find that you are not overpowered by God, but attracted to God voluntarily. Something begins to stir inside of you and think, hey, hey, wait a minute. I don't have to, but wow, how beautiful. I want to. 
That's the emotional effect that the one true God has. Praise the Lord. Psalm 146, verse 1. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Again, capitals here because this is Yahweh. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. There's something here. I mean, he's either under a very strong sense of duty and obligation and you better or else, or he's in love. This is the language of love. I will praise him. Not merely obey him, not just do what I'm told. I will praise him. There's something that's going to rise up from inside me to adore God, and I will do this until my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and their plans die with them, okay? But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in Yahweh, their God. Why? What's so marvelous about this God? Well, he made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, so he's distinguished as the creator, the one who made everything. Think of it this way. He's the architect of the way things ought to operate. He didn't just merely create everything out of nothing in the beginning. He created the systems by which flourishing occurs. He is the creator in that sense, and he keeps every promise forever. Now, the character of God is being articulated. He keeps his promises. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. This isn't Zeus. This isn't Dagon. This isn't Molech. This isn't any portrayal of the common notions of God being sheer power and dominance. He gives justice to the oppressed, food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. He actually cares about those who are adversely affected by genetics gone wrong or some kind of tragedy. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. Those who are depressed, this is a biblical way of describing depression. People are bummed out. People are just, whoa, I don't even know if I want to get up today and pursue my daily duties because I'm so weighed down. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down and he loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among you. He cares for orphans and widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, throughout the generations. Praise Yahweh. Praise him. Why? Well, he gives us a series not of power statements, but of character statements. He didn't say, hey, praise God because he's bigger than you. Praise God because he can do some damage Praise God because he is infinitely more powerful than you, so you had better get your act together. No, praise God because he is a certain kind of God. He keeps his promises. He's faithful to follow through with his word. He gives justice to the oppressed. This is the kind of God God is. He sees those who are hurt and wounded and marginalized in society, and he is interested in their well-being. He protects the foreigners among us. He actually cares about people in a way that transcends national interest. He cares for orphans and widows. Wow, this is completely different than anything we encounter in all ancient literature. There is nothing in the annals of history that portray a picture of a God who gives a rip about anything that's going on among human beings. The gods that are portrayed by the ancients are gods of capricious power, power-mongering, war-mongering gods who care for nothing but the enslavements of human beings. Every false god is known to be false by the oppression the god imposes. If you want to know what's going on 
right beneath the surface in the biblical narrative, the one and only true God of Scripture stands over against every false philosophy, religion, and God in that everything false involves degrading practices that, that take people down gradually, that disintegrate relationships and, and value. Or what we talked about last week together, essentially every false God produces a sense that human beings are commodities to be traded on the market. The objectification, as we noted last week, of the female form, for example, is an indication that we are trafficking in false notions of deity and God when we can claim to be religious and at the same time exploit people sexually. Degrading practices versus upgrading practices. The God of Scripture over and over again is promising through patterns of existence, patterns of living, patterns of relationships that he is prescribing. He's saying, listen, here's how I want you to, to exist with your neighboring countries. Here's how I want you to exist as husbands and wives. This is how I want you to exist as parents with children. This is how I want you to interact. These are the relational dynamics. But he's not an arbitrary God who is prescribing these things because he's in charge. He's the creator of the fine mechanisms of human dynamics that produce flourishing. To know and to serve the one and only true God is to protect your marriage, to protect your relationship with your children, to upgrade your viability as a worker anywhere with anybody. You're just going to be a better human being so that people will be more inclined to employ you if you follow God's principles. The principles that lie at the core of the covenantal system of the Old Testament is a series of upgrading principles that exalt human beings. He told Israel, listen, if you will engage in these practices, I promise you, you will be the head and not the tail in civilization, in society, and in history. Because the practices of covenantal love between human beings, between humans and gods, and between humans and the earth are upgrading practices that produce flourishing. We fast forward to the New Testament, and the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, 4 says... We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world. There's a sense in which idols are vacuous. There's nothing. They're void. There's nothing. There's only one God, truly, Paul says. There's only one God. Everything else is a big, giant masquerade. Everything else is demonic forces trying to insert themselves between the human soul and the one and only true God. But the God of Scripture is so unique that deceased Jewish scholar Abraham Joshua Heschel, who also, by the way, marched with Martin Luther King Jr., he was, well, let me just say about Abraham Joshua Heschel that you should make it a point in your life to read everything he's written. Next time you're tempted to buy something like, I don't know, more shoes or three pizzas, take that money, go to Amazon, and order every book by this guy and read them. He is probing the Old Testament over and over again and unearthing wonders. He is a keen observer of history, and Abraham Joshua Heschel tells us the gods attend, that is the gods in general, the false gods, the idols, the gods attend to great matters, and they neglect small ones, Cicero maintains. He's quoting the ancient Roman historian Cicero, and he's saying, you know, the perception of God is that the gods don't care about the small things of human existence. And according to Aristotle, Heschel informs us, the gods are not concerned at all with the dispensation of good and bad fortune or external things. God could care less about your individual life or what's going on in your neighborhood, your home, your community, your nation. God doesn't have any interest, according to Aristotle, listen, but to the prophets, that is to Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Micah, the prophets, a body of unique literature in the history of mankind. 
gives us a picture of God that is utterly unique in all historical writings. To the prophet, however, no subject, no subject is as worthy of consideration as the plight of man. Just let that register. We're asking a question, how does the one and only true God distinguish himself from all other gods? Well, he cares. He actually cares what's happening to you and every other person. Indeed, God himself is described as reflecting over the plight of man rather than contemplating eternal ideas. This is Plato and Aristotle, Socrates, the great Greek philosophers you know, if you have a conversation with them, it's all head in the clouds philosophizing about metaphysical realities. And the prophets come along and say, but what about hungry people? Well, there are true forms and then there are illusions, Plato says. And the prophets come along and say, but there are some orphans and some widows. Can we go help them? And the philosophers say, but what about the nature of reality itself? And the prophets come along and say, um, but some people are in prison. Should we go visit them? This is what Heschel is telling us. The one and only true God distinguishes himself from every falsehood by actually caring about the things that impact human lives. There's nothing like this in all of ancient literature. God's mind is preoccupied with man, with the concrete actualities of history rather than with timeless, is, timeless issues of thought. Hey, let's all get together, and that's what we're doing right now. Let's get together and think lofty thoughts together. And the prophets would say, well, when you're done thinking your lofty thoughts, go out and be nice to someone. Be kind. Be generous. Be good to people, the prophets would say. This is the will of Yahweh. The one and only true God distinguishes himself with such beauty that in the prophet's message, nothing that has bearing upon good and evil is small or trite in the eyes of God. Nothing that impacts a single human life is small to God. The God of the biblical story is utterly unique among all all the gods of history. There is no one, this is why the prophets are constantly crying out with praise, saying, there is none like you. I mean, quite literally, it's poetic, but quite literally, there is none like you. There is no notion, no idea, no philosophy, no religion. There is nothing ever written that in any way compares to the picture of God painted by the ancient Hebrew prophets. This is a God who takes note of every tear we cry. And to the degree that I, the prophets would tell me, to the degree that I am against anyone, God is against me and my so-called religion. If I'm going to hide in religion to justify the oppression of others, the God of the universe stands against me in all my religiosity, even if I slap the name of Jesus on it. The prophets are a constant rebuke to formal dead religion that goes through the motions of ceremony while neglecting the actual needs of people. Systems of religion that exalt some to the hurt of others are based on false conceptions of God's character. This is the message of the prophets. Bad religion then, of course, makes God look bad. So that we have a phenomenon mentioned earlier where atheism is on the rise, but I've got news for you. People aren't running from the one true God. They're running from false conceptions of God that have made God ugly in their eyes. So that while we think on the surface we're witnessing people running away from God, a lot of people aren't running away from God. They're running, listen, a lot of people are running from, from religion and returning to God by the droves. A lot of people are just up to here with religious people issuing edicts of condemnation against everything that is wrong with them 
rather than offering arms of protection and healing so that they can actually want to be or to do any differently. Where did we get the idea that condemnation somehow is going to make people want to repent of the things they're doing that we're condemning? No, in the biblical narrative, it is faithful love, it is grace, it is mercy that draws the hearts of human beings to him, and then he cleans up their act to whatever degree he deems their act needs to be cleaned up, and he's not going to consult with you about it. So that 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1 brings us to the climactic point of human history. And Paul says, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or, or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I want you to notice something here, that Paul perceives himself as bearing testimony about God. The message that we have to give to the world is a message that is centered on explaining who God really is as opposed to all the ugly and false pictures of God that have people running from him. If God is not beautiful in your eyes, something is wrong with your theological system. So Paul says, listen, I resolved not to know anything among you well, I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why that, Paul? Why Christ crucified? Why is it that you narrowed it down to this one proclamation, Paul? Why is it that you preached Christ and him crucified and that's all? Well, because in Christ crucified, the world witnessed the exact opposite of what it expected from God. The whole world had been primed to believe that God ultimately is all about power and dominance and control. And then God actually came in the flesh, exerted no dominance, power, or control, but voluntarily gave his life to say with skin on it, I love you more than my own existence. The cross of Calvary is the definitive revelation of the love of God. And that's why Paul said, I can't preach anything else. People need to know this testimony about God that Calvary reveals. That when push comes to shove, God won't shove. That when power dynamics are in play, God is underneath the power dynamics with humility and love and sacrifice. And so Paul says, I don't want to preach anything to you except for this magnificent revelation of the love of God. We do, however, speak the message of wisdom among the mature because people aren't going to understand this picture of God. People want a powerful, dominating God, and yet the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age they're all coming to nothing. Every, listen, Paul is saying to you and me, every picture of God, every political process, every economic system, every national religious system in the world that operates on the premise of dominance over others for the elevation and enrichment of the few he says, all of it's coming down. It's coming crashing down. It's all coming to nothing. Everything that is psychologically amplifying the pursuit of power and money and sex as ultimate values, it's all going to come crashing down. And Paul then tells us, astoundingly, no, we declare God's wisdom, which in the context is distinct from all the wisdom of this world. And it's a mystery that has been hidden. It's a hit mystery that has been hidden. Hidden because God wants to hide it? No, hidden because we have been so deeply ingrained with power dynamics that we can't imagine that God would operate other than through the exertion of power. Paul says, no, there's a, there's a hidden wisdom of God. It's a mystery that God 
destined for our glory before time began. And check this out. None of the rulers, the power mongers of our time, none of the rulers of this age understood it. What's it? Nobody understood that love trumps power. Nobody got it. So the Roman state and the Jewish church united to crucify love in the name of God. The ultimate act of idolatry was when the secular power and the religious power united to crucify the one and only true God in the name of their false conception of God. They didn't understand it. For if they had understood that love is ultimate and not power, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So we come full circle to Nietzsche. God is dead and we have killed him. Well, there is a deep irony in his declaration. Yes, historically, in fact, we crucified God. We murdered him. We killed God. When Jesus, when God in the flesh finally came, we killed him because we chose dominance and power over love and mercy. We killed God in order to sustain our religious institutions, essentially. To keep the charade going so that we can feel good about ourselves while trampling upon the rights and the needs of others. And Jesus came along, God in the flesh, to prove that God is love in the most extreme sense imaginable, and we crucified him. And the irony is that we killed God, and you can't kill God. Because he rose on the third day to prove that love is the superior principle. So that in the person of Jesus Christ, we see the true image of the one and only true God, and that image is a love that does fill with infinite satisfaction the inconsolable ache in our hearts. We are that little boy lying on our beds, crying out for our father. And with no vengeance, he comes to us, resurrected in the person of Christ after we've murdered him. And he says, I'm here with you and for you, but I'm here with you and for you and for everybody else. If you're against anybody, that againstness is the very thing I'm against. I'm for you, and I'm for him and her and this one and that one and everyone. I'm for the oppressed. I'm for the orphans. I'm for the fatherless and the widows and the foreigners in our midst. I'm for everyone. And to the degree that we see this picture of God, we will increasingly begin to be for everyone and against no one. And the idolatry that has overtaken our hearts will be finally uprooted and we will find that only the lovers live forever. Hey, thanks so much for watching. We hope that message was a blessing to you. God's word is powerful. It penetrates into our minds, into our hearts, brings about transformation in every aspect of our lives. Listen, we don't want you to miss any content. So again, we wanna encourage you to click on subscribe and track with the content that's going to be coming out week after week. And if you'd like to partner with us in this global ministry of taking the gospel of Christ to the whole world, we want to invite you to become a partner in this ministry. Click give and join with us.